we are, we are going to begin a brand new series uh, this year. Uh, I've, I've preached on this specific book, um, standalone messages, but I've never done a series on this book in the Bible. And so we're going to be taking a deep dive in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah. And uh, I'll give you just a moment to look at the table of contents to find Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah is in the Old Testament. And I'm going to ask you to turn to just two places in your Bibles this morning. Uh, the two places are in the general same area. Second Chronicles, we're going to begin there. Second Chronicles chapter 16. Second Chronicles, it, it's after First Chronicles, right? Uh, but it's, uh, it's after First and Second Kings. So if you go to the beginning of the Bible and go past all of the first few books and... Um, I, be, uh, I believe, uh, is it before or after Psalms or Proverbs? It's right before Psalms. Um, and so you have Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. So go to Second Chronicles chapter 16 and then put a bookmark in Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to be studying uh, throughout the, this month, next five Sundays, uh, we're going to be studying the book of Nehemiah, okay? Nehemiah. We're going to be studying that history, that story. The title of this series is The Great Return, The Great Return, okay? I believe in the screen will say The Return, but that's, that's the title of the series, The Return. And so I'm calling it The Great Return because it's not just a return, it's The Great Return. And, uh, and so Nehemiah, um, you'll notice in your programs this morning, if you came in person, you have a physical Bible reading plan, okay? And there's actually two options, one on each side. Uh, you have two options. Why did we uh, go through the effort of, of making these and putting them in all the programs? Because one of the things that we want to challenge each other with is a return to the Bible, a return to the Word. And we don't want to take it for granted that, that all of us are just reading our Bibles every day. Sometimes, uh, oftentimes, life just happens, and it's one of the foundational things that we often forget. And so uh, we also want to make it easy and also kind of together be in the same area. And so in the Bible reading plan, you'll notice there are two options. And uh, you'll notice that you have not only Nehemiah in the Bible reading plan, but you also have Ezra. Why is that? That's because, um, that's because the... Uh, for, for many years, historically, Ezra, the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were one book. Old Testament Hebrew scriptures have Ezra and Nehemiah not as two separate books, but actually one book. The reason is, is because they cover the same history. And they were always one book. It wasn't until the third century that a man by the name of Orion... Uh, he split the two books up, didn't necessarily do damage to the scriptures in doing so. Um, but what happens is we think they're two separate books, two separate histories. They're actually covering a lot of the same information. They were contemporaries together, both Ezra and Nehemiah. And so that's why uh, we have a, a reading plan that guides you through Ezra and Nehemiah and, uh, and some other scriptures uh, because there were also prophets. There are also books in the Bible that kind of coincided with the history of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, books like uh, Hosea and books like Zechariah and, and, and those books, they were contemporary prophets and had, gave contemporary prophecies while Ezra and Nehemiah uh, were alive and, and doing what they were doing. And so, um, so you have a Bible reading plan that we want everyone. I believe there's the digital copy for you as well. And, uh, and so to kind of get a back, background story, uh, well, first of all, let's read Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. We'll begin there. And then right before we jump into Nehemiah chapter 1, I'll give you a little bit of background, and then we're going to just do a very quick overview of Nehemiah and then dive deep the next four weeks into Nehemiah as we talk about the great return. In Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. We could say that in the year 2022, on this first Sunday, on the second day of the year, 
that the eyes of the Lord are still roaming throughout the earth and he's looking for people whose heart are completely and wholly his, after him. And what does God's word say? That when he finds those people, that God will strongly support that man or the woman whose heart is completely his. Now, why in the study of Nehemiah did we begin with the reading in the book of Chronicles is because you're going to see in a moment that what God found in a man by the name of Nehemiah is a man whose heart was completely his. Second Chronicles, first and second Chronicles, the author of those two books are generally given uh, to Ezra. Historians and theologians believe that Ezra was the author of First and Second Chronicles. First and Second Chronicles, they they it's a it's a chronology, it's a, it's a history of the kings of Israel. But to for us to begin in Nehemiah chapter one, we've got to go all the way back, all the way back four thousand years from today, over four thousand years. In Genesis, you have God who makes covenant with one man by the name of Abraham, changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Abraham has a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob. Jacob has 12. Those 12 find themselves in Egypt. They go into Egypt as a family, and then for 400 years, they're subjugated into slavery in Egypt, and God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses, and the exodus happens, the exit, the deliverance. They go in as a family. They come out as a nation 400 years later. God becomes their God as they make their trek way back to the land of Israel that God had promised all the way back in Genesis 12 to Abraham. And so during that time, they were led by judges, they were led by prophets, and as the children of Israel were doing life in the nation of Israel, they were looking at the nations around them, and, and, and they saw that other nations had earthly kings. Israel didn't have an earthly king. Israel had God. But they wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted a king that they can see, that they can, they can look at, that they can hear from. And God says, but I'm your king. And the children of Israel look at God and say, well, you're not enough. So God brokenheartedly would say, well, I will give you what you desire. And it will have both benefits and consequences. Their first king, King Saul, turned out to be uh, a man who was a half-hearted follower of God. There were times where he did things well, and then there were times where he just blew it. And so God, while Saul was still king, anoints and picks his successor while he's still in leadership. And that would be David, a man after God's own heart. David had his faults. I mean, he had many, and they were great. But David was a man after God's own heart. And under David's rulership, under David's kingship, God will make a promise to David and say that, that your throne will never end. And he prophesied that the Messiah would come from the line of David. David would go on to have a son. His name was Solomon. Solomon uh, not only uh, Solomon took a little bit further the sins of his father David, and his heart uh, would, would stray from the Lord. And he, Solomon, would be credited to writing most of the Proverbs in the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and then after Solomon, things got pretty bad. Solomon has a son by the name of Rehoboam. This is the, the king, the fourth king of all of Israel. And under Rehoboam, Solomon's son, Israel is split because Rehoboam chose to take the advice of his friends over the counsel of wise elders. And so the, the kingdom of Israel was split into two. The nation was split into two. The northern part, which retained the name Israel, and the southern part, with Jerusalem, retained the name of Judah. Jeroboam would become the king of northern Israel, Rehoboam the king of southern Israel. Jeroboam was uh, the, the king that introduced drive-by idolatry. Rehoboam was wicked, so was Jeroboam. Sprinkled throughout, if you read 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, you'll have one good king here and there, uh, but most of those kings turned the heart 
of God's people, the nation, to idolatry. The key lesson that we learn is that idolatry leads to captivity. It begins with a, a, a nation by the nation of Assyria who comes and they take over the northern kingdom of Israel. And then here's an important historical date. In 586 B.C., before Christ, 586, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Babylon was the leading world power at that time, they invade and completely sack and destroy Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Israel, Judah. They destroy Solomon's temple, they burn down the walls and the gates, and they completely obliterate the nation of Judah. The southern nation. They take captives. This is where we have the books of Daniel and other books in the Bible. They come out of that time period. But Daniel prophesied, Jeremiah the weeping prophet prophesied that 70 years would be the years of bondage. But then they would be set free. Very popular scriptures that, we, that, that parents choose for their babies when they dedicate them. That we look and begin a new year like in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 33 where it talks about, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That was written during Babylonian captivity. Where he was looking at a people in exile, at a people in bondage, and saying, you're there because of idolatry. Because idolatry leads to captivity. But if you return to me, then I will remember. Because my plans for you are to prosper you and not to harm you. They're to bless you. But you've left. But if you return to me, with all, if you seek me with all of your heart, you will find me and you'll find freedom and you'll find deliverance. In your return, there will be a revival. There will be an awakening. There will be a return of my blessing on your life. And so you have, you have Babylon who had taken in 586 B.C. And then Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar was replaced. They were conquered by the Persians. That's where we have King Cyrus. Who's King Cyrus? He's the one, if you've ever seen uh, One Night with the King, the story of Esther and all that story. And now the Persians are in power. The Persians are in power. So they take uh, uh, some of these people that Babylon had, and, and now they're the ones in power, so it's Persia and the kings of Persia, and they're the ruling part, but, but the Persians were a little bit different. They, 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 they had what we would know today as religious tolerance. They would conquer nations, and they would allow these people groups to go back to their nations and rebuild their places of worship. And they would tolerate that because Persians were a little bit smart politically. They figured if we treat these nations that we have subjugated in this way, then they would, at least as their captors, they would like us. And we can keep diplomatic relationships with these nations. We oversee them, but we've given them something, and so at least they'll love their like their captivity. And so what happens is that there are three waves of return to Jerusalem, three waves. The first one is under Zerubbabel, really cool name, right? What mother names their kid Zerubbabel? If your name is Zerubbabel, I'm sorry, it's a good name. It's a really good name. Zerubbabel, funny name, but a great leader. He leads the first wave back to Jerusalem, and he begins to rebuild the temple. That history is found in Ezra chapters 1 through 6. Then in Ezra chapter 7 through 10, there's a second wave led by a man named Ezra. Ezra, Ezra begins to rebuild the worship. Zerubbabel comes back and he rebuilds the temple. He begins the process of rebuilding the temple. Ezra returns in the second wave and he begins to rebuild and instill worship of God. There's a return of altars and worship. And then Nehemiah leads the third wave. And Nehemiah has the calling to rebuild the walls and the gates of the city. And that's where we find ourselves in, in Nehemiah chapter 1, the beginning of the third wave of return. Verse 1, we'll read through verse 4. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, which it's a Jewish month, uh, which would be November, December, our, our time, 
okay, November, December, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa in Persia, Persia, modern-day Iran, this was a winter home for the king of Persia in Susa, the citadel of Susa, Hanan, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah, the southern portion of Israel. He came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was blessed with a burden. He was blessed with a burden. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9, remembers the first scripture we read, it says that the eyes of the Lord are roaming throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart are completely his. Why? Because God's work begins in the heart. That before there's a return of anything, there must be a return of the heart of hearts of men and women back to God. Why? Because God is after your heart. God sees the heart. The most important thing that you and I have been called to guard, it says it in Proverbs 4.23, is above all else of first priority, of number one attention. Guard your heart. Why? Why is the heart important? Because everything flows from your heart. Your year will move in the direction of your heart. Your life will move in the direction of the condition of your heart. Your heart affects everything about you. It affects whether you're generous or not. It affects whether you're loving or not. It affects whether you're liked or not. It affects whether you can get God's attention and find his support. It's the condition of your heart. And Nehemiah was blessed with the burden in his heart. How do we know this? Because in Nehemiah chapter 2, it says, that, it says that in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, king of, 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 of Persia, when wine was brought for him, Nehemiah said, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. The king recognized that Nehemiah wasn't before him, and by the way, it says he had never been sad before him, which means that he would show up to work. And he would have dealt with his emotions every day. Whatever he was going through, people at the job never knew. He wasn't those kind of people that would show up to work just all humped so that somebody can ask him, what's wrong with you? No. But this day, there was a sadness that he could not cover. Why? Because it was a sadness of a heart. It was a burden of the heart. He was blessed with a burden. And listen to me. What burdens you, what bothers you is often a key to your assignment. As pastors and as leaders, we often get people to tell us, Pastor, this bothers me. Pastor, I have a burden for this. Translation, I want you to do something about this. Here's the thing. If it bothers you, if it burdens you, maybe, just maybe, it's not our assignment, but it is your assignment to do something with the blessing, the burden that you've been blessed with, the thing that bothers you, the thing that burdens you, and you look around and you think, well, am I alone? It it doesn't seem to bother anyone else. What's wrong with these people? It's maybe because God has placed a burden on you so that you can do something with the problem and with the thing that bothers you. 
I'm not trying to shuck off responsibility here, but listen, there are things, there are burdens that I've been blessed with. Have you ever been blessed with a burden? And by the way, if you're thinking, if you're thinking right now, well, it's unbiblical to be blessed with a burden because the Bible says to cast your burdens down. No, Jesus said, come unto me, all of you who are tired and weak and heavy laden, and take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? No, we, we, when, when, we, when we allow God to bless us, when our hearts are returned to God, God will bless us with a burden that will feel light in the sense that God will give us the ability, the anointing. He'll give us the, the strength to be able to deal with the burden, with the problem that he's placed on us. And so Nehemiah was blessed with a burden. He was blessed with a burden, and it was a burden of the heart. I don't know if you've ever been blessed with a burden, but I remember, I remember the reason that, that we're in what we're in today is because I remember that as an 18-year-old, as a 19-year-old, I was blessed with a burden. I remember, I remember not only getting born again at the age of 16 and being filled with the Holy Spirit at the age of 17, but it was in that same moment where I received a calling from God my assignment, and I began to be burdened about the lostness of humanity, and it was a burden, and it's still a burden to this day. It's, it's both a blessing and a burden. It's something that weighs on your heart. It's that thing that you say to yourself, there's nothing else that I can do in life. This is what I'm called to. It's not a job. It's a calling. God has placed this on me. It's like chains that have wrapped my heart, and I, will, I cannot die. I cannot give in. I cannot do anything else until I fulfill and I accomplish what God has called me to do. I remember that at a very young age. And if you let him, God will bless you with a burden. He'll bless you with a burden. And the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11, that what he did with that is that he went to Jerusalem. So he traveled from where he was in Persia to Jerusalem. And by the way, he was a cupbearer. He was the king's cupbearer. Translation, he had a position of prestige, of power, of prominence, right? He, he had, he had a, a great position. He was a, a governmental leader, a civic leader. He was the one in charge of making sure that everything that the king ate and drank wasn't poisoned. Right? So, he, so, so, so Nehemiah was, I mean, he, he had favor with the king. He was very close to the king. Nehemiah would take the first sip of the cup just to make sure, you know, that nothing was in there. I mean, he had a very, very high position, and he shares with the king the burden on his heart. And because of favor, right, because the Bible says that if your heart is fully to God, that he will strongly support Right? And in Nehemiah's world, what that looked like was the support of the king because the king then said, hey, go ahead and, and deal with this burden that you carry. And not only did the king release Nehemiah, but he funded. He wrote a blank check and said, whatever you need, I'll cover it. And so in chapter 2, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem, and after staying there for three days, he set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one that I was riding on. By night, I went throughout the valley. So in chapter 2, you have Nehemiah. Chapter 1, he receives the blessing of a burden. He's released by his king to go and figure out what's happening in Jerusalem after he receives this report. In chapter 2, he is scoping out the land. Notice the language here. He's going out at night. He is not sharing his burden with just anybody or with everybody. But he takes some time to scope things out. He got the report in Nehemiah chapter 1, and that report gripped his heart. He was blessed with a burden. And so in chapter 2, he goes to Jerusalem to see for himself and to get the reality on the ground, what's happening in real time. And he goes out secretly. He goes out at night. 
It's what we've been doing the last few months as a staff and as leaders and some of the people that have been praying with us is before we share what God is saying in 2022 and all of this, we've been in secret and in gatherings and in meetings, praying and surveying and saying, God, what do we see? What are you doing? And for the last number of months, we've been blessed with a burden. What's that burden? We've been trickling it out little by little. But this month, we're allowing it to be said to everybody. The, 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 the burden has been that there is a great return coming. There's something that God is doing. For the last few months, we've been walking around at night and praying at night and meeting at night and saying, what is God doing? What's the strategy? What's happening? Where are we headed? What are we doing? That's what chapter 2 Nehemiah is like. And here's what Nehemiah found. He found walls and gates that were broken down. And that burden that he was blessed with, attached to it, was an assignment. And that assignment was to rebuild what's broken. To rebuild what's broken. They said to him in Nehemiah chapter 1 that the walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when he heard these things, it bothered him. It bothered him to the point... That the Bible says he wept and he cried and he fasted and he prayed and he mourned for days. So what? These walls and gates were burned. He lived in Persia. He had a high position. He had a prominent position. He had prestige. He had power. He had popularity. He had comfortability. But God had placed placed such a burden on him for his temple, for his city, for his people, that when he got the report, the Bible says that he fasted and he mourned and he cried. He said, God, this has to bother somebody. And he says, yes, it bothers me. And so now, because you've given me your heart, I am placing you the burden that I'm carrying as God for my people. Nehemiah goes back and he says, it's the walls and the gates that are broken down. Now, what's significant about that? Who cares? The temple has been rebuilt, mostly, for the most part. There's some form of worship returning. But so what? What what about the walls and the gates? Listen to me. The vulnerability and strength of a fortress or stronghold always rested in its walls and gates. Now, follow me for just a moment. Don't lose me because this is the point of the message where we begin to relate what's happening to all of us. The gates and the walls of a city, the vulnerability and strength of the temple, of the city of Jerusalem, always rested in its walls and gates. Its walls kept out enemy invaders, And the gates determined what came in, grain, right, the the, the trades, but also what was to stay out, the gates. What's important about walls and gates? I'm here to tell you that I know it's not popular today to talk about, you start talking about building walls, you'll, you'll divide a church. But do you know that in your home and in your family, you have invisible walls and gates? And depending on the strength of those walls and gates, they determine the vulnerability or the strength of your home and your family. Our families have walls and gates. Our marriages have walls and gates. Our relationships have walls and gates. Nehemiah found that these walls and gates were broken down. They were defenseless, meaning that the walls were torn down so the enemy was able to come in and plunder and do whatever they had. There was no security. There was no safety. And as far as the gates, anything goes. Whatever came in, came in. Whatever came out, came out. And we wonder why families are falling apart and marriages are falling apart and children are acting crazy and money's acting funny and it seems like everything is going to I'm here to declare to you that it's because there have been broken walls and gates in the families and in the homes and in the marriages. And it's got to bother somebody. 
Somebody has to be blessed with a burden that through tears and through mourning and through fasting say it's not okay. It's not normal for marriages to end into divorce, for kids to be out with their parents and parents to be out with their kids and families to be destroyed. That is not God's best for you. That's not God's plan for you. That is captivity because the walls and the gates of the home and of the family in the 21st century have been torn down. They've been destroyed. And so the enemy comes in and takes whatever he wants to take. He'll take your joy. He'll take your peace. He'll take your security. And in his place, he'll just let whatever come in. We, we, all, we all determine. We determine what comes in and out of our gates, of our homes. My wife and I, I don't know how you spent your Christmas week. <laughs> Christmas, New Year's week, my wife and I, I spent it. I am not ashamed. I'm a proud husband to tell you that with my wife, we watch time period romances. We were searching high and low on Netflix, on Amazon, on Hulu, on all kind of devices. What are some of the best time period uh, series and movies and stuff? Because I enjoy them with my wife. You know why? Because I enjoy my wife. And we found one and we thought maybe this is good. Maybe this is good. And so we started watching the first episode. We looked at it and said, what's it rated? Because ratings matter to us. Why? Because we have gates in our home. We, the Riveras have a gate. And so we, we began the first episode. And man, just halfway through, we looked at each other and we just knew, we can't watch this. We have to shut this off. And we don't care what people say, how great it is, we can't watch it. You know why? Because we have gates in our home and in our marriage and in our family. And we determine, not culture, not the preacher down the street, not you. No, we determine what comes into our home. And that day we determine this is not coming into our home. Why? Because we want, we want purity in our home. We want holiness in our home. We want God in our home. We want the Holy Spirit in our marriage. But walls and gates are broken down everywhere. There are no standards. There are no standards. The walls are broken down. And listen to me. You pray all you pray, but faith won't fix what you won't face. And you cannot live vicariously through your pastor. The mark of maturity in a believer is shifting from God do that to God use me. And if there's anything powerful about the book of Nehemiah is that it was both prayer and planning. It was both prayer showing dependency on God and planning, showing that we have a responsibility to do something, to fix something, and to rebuild what's broken. We pray for marriages and children and families and structures and things and people. And our prayers are, God, do that. God, fix that. And God is saying, listen, I'm willing to do the impossible, but you have to at least do the possible. Because faith will not fix what you're unwilling to face. And Nehemiah, he didn't get a sugar-coated report. He got, a, he got a real authentic. This is the state of the nation. Not with flowers on it, but it is bad. And he goes for himself, and he surveys, and yes, the walls are broken down. They're vulnerable. Things are coming in. Things are going out. And so the Bible, the Bible says in Nehemiah 4, 6 that we rebuilt the wall. They, got, they did stuff. And so the Bible says he convinced people to come and actually, no, back up, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. After I looked things over, this is Nehemiah. He said, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And then what does he say? Fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Why is it important? 
Why is it important that we, that we lean into this year and we lean in and, and, and we take this, we take the, uh, the, 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 the Bible reading plan and we become serious about getting back to the word and getting back to prayer. And by the way, we're gathering tonight to, to worship and to have pastors and elders lay hands on. Why are those things important? It's important because somebody has to fight for the family and fight for the homes and fight for the sons and fight for the daughters. It matters. It matters. It matters to God. It should matter to us. Nehemiah 4, 6 says, so we rebuilt the wall. This is a powerful verse. Just look at it. We rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Do you see it? Do you see it took it took their whole heart to build half a wall. It took their whole heart to build half a wall. Today, in the 21st century, we give half our heart and we expect a whole wall. We give God part and we expect a final product. There's some of us that are giving half our heart to our marriage and half our heart to our career and half our heart to the church and half our heart to our walk with God and half our heart to friendships and we wonder why we don't even have half a wall. And I think that it's about time that the church stop tiptoeing around these things and stop tiptoeing about what matters and come and return fully in our hearts completely back to God and give them our whole heart. And have the kind of attitude that'll say, I'll give my whole even if it's just for half. What would it look like if we gave our whole? What would it look like if we just stopped, if we, if we, if we got off the fence and stopped, and stopped counting the cost and, and stopped and stop thinking and playing and, and said, no, God, the year 2022, it's the year that I return in my heart. I return in my heart fully and completely. I will give you my whole heart. Listen, I'm telling you what well, you said, well, half isn't enough. I don't just want half of my kids saved and half of my finances okay. I, I want the whole. I get it. I get it. But listen, give God your whole and at least you'll get half. What do you do with the other half? You trust a God that is true true. You do what you can. You do you and you let God be God. And I promise you that the other half will take care of itself. Why? Because he's a good God. Let's give our whole heart. That means next Sunday morning when you come, we don't go halfway in worship. We don't just sit back, but we, we go fully and come to the altar. I'm not just going to lift one hand. I'm not just going to go I'm going to go all the way. I'm going to lift both hands. I'm going to give my whole heart in worship. I'm going to give my whole heart. In a few weeks, in a few weeks, when we start unveiling kingdom builders and, and what God has us to do this year, it's, it'll be determined how much of our hearts God has. Does he have half a heart? Does he have a whole heart? I want to be all in. I want to be all in. Why? Because there are some things at stake. We've got to rebuild some walls. We've got to rebuild broken things. We've got to rebuild the wall of prayer. We've got to rebuild the, the, the wall of God's word. We've got to rebuild the wall of regathering. We've got to rebuild some things. It's not going to happen with half-hearted people. It's going to be people that are all in. And then this is the part of the message. Whereas as your pastor, I say to you, or you get, get a sense that your pastor is Nehemiah in the story. He's the leader rallying the people. Build the wall, build the wall. We've got to do this for God and for country. But I must confess to you, I am not Nehemiah. 
feels like it sometimes. There's things I can relate with as a leader. But I'm not Nehemiah. Let's read on and we'll close in just a moment. But in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab. Who Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem? They are the adversaries. They are the persecutors. They are the naysayers. They are the ones who like that the walls have been reduced to rubble and the gates have been broken. They are the enemies of God and the enemy of God's people. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab. And the rest of our enemies, when word came to them that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Now notice how the enemy comes. When you begin to rebuild the walls in your family, the wall of prayer, the wall of worship, the wall of the family altar, when you begin to determine, hey kids, we're going back to church. So thankful for technology, but we're going back. We're going to go back to the gathering. Why? Because there's something that happens there that doesn't happen here. We're going back. We're returning. When you begin to do that, it's not always that it's like all hell breaks loose. It often comes very subtle and very softly. Watch how it comes. Sanballat doesn't come with an army and says, you stop it right now. You know what he does? He comes and he says, come let us meet together. In one of the villages on the plain of Ono. It's funny how the enemy will often speak to you. And he says things that right off the bat, you just know. Come and meet with me in the valley of Ono. Oh, no. I cannot meet with you in the valley of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. Oh, come. Just take Sunday off. Come. Just take the month off. Oh, come. Just easy, comfortable. Stop the working. Take a break. Just come. All this building stuff, this praying stuff, this going to church on Sunday night, this, this, oh, oh no. Just come to, oh no. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. Four times. They didn't stop. They just kept after it. And each time I gave them the same answer. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. And this happens to you. This happens. I'm telling you, you get serious with God. Hey, 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 come down, come down, come down, come down. You don't have to be that serious for God. Whoa, 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 every Sunday? No. Christmas and Easter, that's it. What? You're, you're going to be a kingdom builder? What's that mean? You give 10% and over and above? Hey, 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 come down, come down. That's too much. Yeah, when, whenever you got, when you first got born again, Remember when you first got born again and you were excited and you were telling people and you were excited. What did they say? Hey, 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 come down. Come down. We like the old Joe. This uppity, high uppity. Come down. We'll give you a week. We'll give you two. Come down. I can't come down and then make you feel guilty. You think you're better than us. You just up. You found religion. You're zealous. You're passionate. It's none of that. It's not that I'm better than you. It's that God is better than anything I've ever tasted. And the, I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why? Because I'm fighting for my family and I'm fighting for my children and I'm fighting for the next generation. And what I do 
do matters. What I do counts. I'm building up the walls in my home again. I'm building up the wall of prayer. Why? For successive generation, I want my children and my children's children to just not rise up and call me blessed. But I want to build a home that honors God and serves God and loves God and waits with open arms the return of the King. I want my children and my children's children to be a part of that. I cannot go down the, gr- the work that I'm carrying on. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop? Because your passion and your zeal reminds them that they're not wholehearted. And half-hearted people will tell wholehearted people, come down. I can't come down, Emma. I said, I am carrying on a great project. I am blessed with a burden, and I'm rebuilding what is broken. And Nehemiah Listen to me. I am not Nehemiah. Boy, we've got to close. I'm so sorry. we got to let you go. Like, very soon. I am not Nehemiah. Nehemiah reminds me of Jesus. Jesus in Mark chapter 15, verse 29. The Bible says that those who passed by, there's Jesus hanging on the cross, and those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, Come down from the cross and save yourself. Come down to the valley of Ono. Prove. Verse 32 says, let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults at him. Come down. And Jesus hung on that cross in Golgotha with arms stretched wide open. And he looked at Sanballat and Geshem and all of the haters and the naysayers, the half-hearted people and he declared, I can't come down I am carrying on a great project I'm carrying on a great project and I cannot go down why should this work stop while I leave it and go down to you? I am carrying on the project of redemption. I am through my death, through my spilling of blood. I am going to redeem people. I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for generations. I'm doing this for humanity. I cannot stop this amazing project of salvation and redemption and deliverance. I cannot go down. I've come to rebuild. And God told me to tell you, Victory Christian Center, that we're going from rubble to revival. Wholehearted, wholehearted clap. We're going from rubble to revival. We're going to see things that have been broken down and shattered and laid down in ruins. God is saying, I'm going from rubble to revival. There is a supernatural reset that is happening in the year 2022. And God is saying, we cannot get down from building what has been broken because it matters. And the the project is too important. What God is doing is too important. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah, Jesus. Honey, would you join me? I'm so glad we've got four more weeks. My goodness, because there's so much in this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to bless you because we have to. Listen, it's not because we're led by the clock, not the Holy Spirit. Do you realize we have children workers? and kids and and we want to honor them and we've already taken we've gone a little but that's okay we're they'll forgive us we're gonna bless you and if you're here listen to me if you're here and you're far from God if you hear and you feel like Holy Spirit is speaking to you in any way please don't leave here without responding even if it's just for a second or a moment even if it's just to say God I, I I want to give you my whole heart. Help me in doing so. And then do something about it. Take the reading plan. Begin. Begin this year. Begin this week. Begin on Monday, the first Monday of the year. Say, God, I'm going to sit down. I don't normally read my Bible, but I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read. I'm going to start digging in. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, God is doing something. 
So prayer team, come. As our prayer team comes, we're going to bless you. At the end of this blessing, if you're here and you need prayer for any reason, any reason at all, we want to pray for you. You just come down and you receive prayer. Maybe you just need somebody to agree with you in an area of prayer, in any area. We'll pray for you if that's you. At the end of this blessing, you just come down and receive prayer. Friends and family of Victory Christian Center, I bless you. I bless you to be rebuilders of walls that have been torn down, restorers of streets to dwell in, repairers of the breach, that God would use your life to restore, to rebuild, and to revive things in your home and your family and your job and your relationships and your school. That God would bless you with a burden and that you would fight that you would fight for your families and your homes and your sons and your daughters and this region, Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, until we see the glory of God come and wave after wave after wave of unchurched and church wounded. Come and regather and we restore worship and return to altars and return and God will revive out of rubble. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Come on, if you need prayer, just come. We want to pray for you.